the myth, soft tissue injuries heal within six to 12 weeks and require no care beyond that point. They generally heal without residuals, right? I know you've heard that. Uh, doctors hear it all the time. Um, in 2004, I published my first textbook, and uh, my publisher is Lippincott Williams and Wilkins, which is one of the top two medical publishers in the world. And in the first book, there is a table in there that I went over, long-term prognosis for cervical trauma reported in the literature. Let's fly through some of these to see if that statement is accurate. Let's start off in 1956. In this study, 46% of the patients were chronic at greater than a year follow-up. <clears throat> and then we can jump down here on the low end, here at one and a half years, 12% were chronic. Now, here, folks, this is the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. That's not the National Enquirer, okay? Here, we got 44 to 90% of the patients had chronic pain at two-year follow-up. On and on and on it goes. Um, you know, look at here, Watkinson Gargan. That's a very, it's a very famous study right here, 1991 in the journal Injury. 86% chronicity at 10.8 year follow-up. Now, how many of those patients have had their cases resolved uh, legal-wise, right? Their cases have been settled, and yet they're still complaining with symptoms. Um, on and on. What is the estimated damage cost to the vehicle you're in? And I know you've been beat up on this one a lot, okay? So let's talk about that. First of all, there's no relationship to the vehicle damage in the patient passenger injury. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Bold statement, but actually very, very true and accurate. The most important question is not what is the damage to the vehicle. The most important question is what was the acceleration of the vehicle after impact? That's what correlates with the injury. All right, Ian McNabb, um, you know, for many years was considered to be the big name in medicine on the issue of cervical trauma, okay, in motor vehicle accident. He's published a lot on it. And uh, old paper in 1982 talks about the amount of damage sustained by the car bears little relationship to the force applied. And here's the real thing that really hammers on. He gives a good analogy here. He talks about if you take a car and you put it in concrete, okay, and you got people in there. Take another car and you put it on a sheet of ice and then you hit both vehicles with the same force. The car that's in concrete is going to be damaged a whole lot worse, right? It's going to get crumpled up. The car on ice, not going to get that much damage. But potentially, the people in the car that was on the ice are probably going to be, have a much more significant injury than the people that are in the concrete. Why? You're going to find out. We'll talk about the law of conservation of linear momentum. Force is going to go somewhere. Why is it that these race cars are designed where they bust into all these different pieces? You ever notice that? You NASCAR guys, okay, or Indy, whatever? That's because as each piece flies off, it's taking force with it. Because they're trying to save that guy, the race car guy or girl now, right? They're trying to save their life. They want to take the force away from the occupant. So force is going to go somewhere. The car, if it doesn't absorb it, guess who's going to absorb it? The, potent, the patient, the potential patient. It's just like this here. Now picture. This milk, okay, is a person, okay? Now, if your person is the fluid is in here and you shatter this glass, guess what happens? What is the, is the fluid going to be disrupted as much as this right here? Of course not. Of course not because, again, we had the shattering of the, uh, the vehicle, so to speak. And this one here is elastic, so wham, all that force is jumping around and goes on the patient. What if you've got someone that has problems, they have injury, they are being treated, they have pain, and it's there, okay? Obviously, we're going to report the truth. We're going to report what we know. We have to do that. We have no other choice, right? Got to do that. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because you know what's going to happen, okay? They're going to put all the blame on that. But you can do what's called an apportionment, okay? Again. Very simple. It is subjective because you're relying on the patients answering the questions, but it's an attempt to objectify the pre-existing injury. So we get the patient to rate their pain severity on a one through four, and there's the, 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 the verbiage there, and also the frequency of the pain, okay? And then we have them do this, their symptoms they had before the accident and then after the accident. And then very simple formula here, which we won't go over, 
but when you run the numbers, in this case here, Mrs. Jones has a pre-existing injury of 15%. So we've assessed that 15% of her present problem is attributable to the symptoms that she had before the accident. Again, if an insurance adjuster uh, disagrees with that, well, my question is, well, what's your number? What's your number? This is what we've tried to do. What's your number, and how did you come up with that? When the trauma occurs, the whole movement and the rapid uh, extension flexion of the head and neck, it, it's over and done with so fast. On average, uh, about 250 milliseconds to 350 milliseconds, and this is too fast for basically your muscles to kick in and the reflex muscle response to prevent those joints from rip, rip, and damaging the ligaments and the connective tissue. That's why it's a big deal, is because it happens so quickly. So if we look at some of the, uh, the research here, Severy uh, is one of the most famous researchers on this, but this here kind of shows the average uh, injury. This is an 8.2 mile per hour uh, rear end accident. And it talks about the front of the vehicle is going to accelerate about 2 G's, okay, the rear 2 G's. But here is the entire event is done and over with here in about 300 milliseconds. But look at the force, the, the 2 G acceleration of the vehicle, but the, it is magnified to 5 G's as far as the force that happens to the head and neck. And that's why it's a big deal because of this magnification of force. But new research came out years ago that really showed in low impact collisions where the injury comes from. And it's not from this and this, it's from this S, this configuration of the neck that goes into an S form. And this is the big study, Grauer. Again, spine, one of the number one orthopedic journals in the world. And uh, cutting to uh, the chase here, um, what's happened is here, <clears throat> at this moment, at around 100 milliseconds, the spine, the cervical spine, forms this S configuration. That what you're dealing with here is a flexion injury in the upper cervical spine and an extension injury in the lower cervical spine. So let's show you. This here is a, a redraw in one of my textbooks here that shows the progression. But this is where it happens, right in this range here. Here's a better picture. See this right here? They've done incredible studies with pho photogrammetry and, and other high-tech uh, imagery to really demonstrate what happens to the spine. And this is it, guys. This is the smoking gun. This is what they have find, found why that low impact collisions create this injury. Because at this moment, before the head goes into extension, you've got this extension injury here that goes beyond the normal physiological range of motion of those articulations. And then here is the flexion injury. 